Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felder, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Felder. Okay, good to see everybody in this afternoon. My, we've got the old studio filling up a little more all the time. One of these days, we're going to have to buy more tables, aren't we? Uh, Gary, where is Gary? I guess he's out in the truck. I remember when we first started talking about doing this, uh, I told the guys, I said, well, I will not produce a program unless I've got people out in front of me with tables and uh, where they can have a book and uh, their notes and so forth. You know what their answer was? Well, we got the room if you got the tables. <laughs> so uh, we started right out buying the tables and chairs, and it uh, just looks now like we're going to have to buy a few more. Okay, for those of you out in television, again, we'd just like to welcome you to just a plain, simple Bible study. We're not preaching to anybody. We're not uh, attacking anyone. I don't think we've ever done that. In fact, I had a letter the other day that... Uh, made that point. He said, I love your program because you never attack anyone. Well, why should we? Because uh, the book speaks for itself. And uh, that's all we want to do is to just get folks to see what the Word of God says. Not what I say or what anyone else says, but what does the book say? And so again, those of you in television, how we appreciate your letters, your phone calls, your encouragement, and uh, the knowledge that you're praying for us every day. Okay. Like I said, this is a Bible study. We're going to go right in now and uh, look at Hebrews, where we left off in our last taping, chapter 10. And I think the next verse will be verse 23. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. And uh, we had finished with verse 22, of course. And now it says, let us hold fast, just like an anchor. Let us hold fast the profession of our, what? Faith. Faith. Now you know that that is one of the key words that I'm emphasizing. And we're going to see it explained explicitly when we get to chapter 11. But faith, faith, faith. I just can't emphasize enough. Taking God at His word. And this is the whole idea of our relationship with God is to believe what he has said. And uh, even though we use all of Scripture, yet Paul is the apostle to us as Gentiles. And I maintain that if people would just simply study and believe what Paul writes in his epistles, you wouldn't need these bookstores full of how-to books. Wouldn't need them. Because he covers every problem of life. And we can solve that problem with what? Faith. Believing what God has said about it. But it's so hard for people to get that through their head, that faith is just simply taking God at His word. He said it. Believe it. And now Paul says, hang on to it. Don't let it just become something that you're careless about. But just hang on that this is what God says, and I'm believing it, come what may. All right, without wavering. Now, why does Paul admonish these people then to hang on to their faith? Because God is faithful. See, men can say things, they can even sign contracts, but it's not worth the paper it's written on. But that's not what God is. God is faithful, and He will always keep his word. All right, then let's move on. Verse 24, and to let us consider one another to provoke or to prod unto love and good works. Now, you see, the beauty of the Christian community is that we should not be attacking each other. We should not be smiling and laughing over some fellow Christian's misfortune but rather we should be constantly encouraging one another. My goodness, you don't get a word of encouragement from the world. Not a word. And yet we're all human. You know, I don't have to have my feathers stroked three, four times a day, but boy, once in a while it sure helps to have one say, well, Les, your program has blessed my life. Of course, we're human, and, and we appreciate that. But even in our everyday contacts with fellow believers, we should be encouraging one another. 
and not attacking and pulling down, see? And so we provoke one another. We encourage one another to love each other as well as to practice good works. Now, I think maybe I shared it in the last taping. I don't know, but a lot of times people, especially when they get older and they're no longer able to do the, the fast-paced work when they were young, they'll say, well, Les, what can I do? There's not, there nothing I can do so far as works are concerned. Well, I had a gentleman come up at our seminar in Oklahoma City last month. I think I shared it on the program, but if I did, don't hurt to say it again. And uh, he liked to work with wood, and that was his hobby. Well, he had started making walking canes with a hand held and then a cane. And uh, he says, you know what I do with these? Just as fast as I can make them, I take them out to people in nursing homes who need a cane. And he says, it just thrills them to death that now they've got a beautiful hand-made cane. Well, who would ever think of something like that as good work? Well, God does. God looks at that, and that's a good work. See, that's something that is bringing some happiness, some joy to people in a particular need. So don't ever say, well, there's nothing I can do. You'd be surprised how many places there are that God can use whatever you're capable of doing. All right, now then verse 25 is a verse that I suppose a lot of times is taken totally out of context. And it's stretched to the limit, but uh, we're just going to take it for what it says. That now as fellow believers... We are in the business of encouraging one another. We are to increase our love for one another because of who has loved us first. But now, verse 25, we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Now, when you get into the Greek, this assembling of ourselves is a lot stronger than here in the English. What it really means is assembling together with our own kind. Now, you know, birds of a feather do what? They flock together. But too many times, Christians don't. And uh, I have people calling constantly where they're attending a church that things are said and done that just simply don't fit with their own belief system. And what am I going to tell them? Well, tough it out. Stay with them. Heavens no. Get out of there. They're not your own kind. And find a place where they are. And uh, this is exactly what it means, that you're to assemble yourselves together with like-minded believers. Don't try to compromise your own belief system in order to get along with a group that is contrary to what you feel the Word declares. Now, again, we're in a time and an age when most of us think that if your church isn't 6,000 members, and if you haven't got a 200-voice choir and a big orchestra down front, you're just not with it. Well, I got news for you. That is not the New Testament church at all. Now, it has come to that, and we certainly aren't going to tell people to lock their doors, but that is not the concept of believers coming together in the early church. And I don't think it's going to end up that way. I think, once again, it'll come back to where you have true believers meeting in rather small groups. I was reading a secular magazine the other night, Secular magazine. And I could just gather between the lines that our days of freedom and liberty as true Christians are numbered. I mean that. Our days are numbered. And uh, if the Lord doesn't come, even those of us that are a little bit gray-haired, we're probably going to see some tough times. And that's why I think we should pray earnestly that the Lord will come. And with those kind of situations, as it was in China, remember, uh, after the communists took over China, the church went underground. And uh, by that, we simply mean that they met secretly in their apartment complexes. They had house churches. And so when missionaries went back into China after the doors kind of opened up, they were just astounded at how many true believers were throughout China simply because they had survived with small house churches. And uh, we better get prepared. It may come back to that. So rather than just try to find something that's the biggest church going and the most exciting and the most entertaining, it's far more profitable spiritually to gather with maybe a smaller group that are truly feeding on the Word of God. In fact, as I, I look at this verse, I have to think, what did the Lord Himself say back in the Gospels? Where two or three are gathered in my name, then what? I'm in the midst of them. 
And uh, so let's always keep that in mind. So don't forsake the assembling. We do need Christian fellowship. Now, of course, I know we get letters every day from shut-ins, from people who are no longer able to go out into a public worship. And uh, programs like ours are, of course, their spiritual food. And that's understandable. But as long as we're able to uh, assemble with fellow believers, even if it's in a smaller environment, don't ever forsake that. All right, but we're to be exhorting or encouraging one another. And then this is interesting. Here, this is probably written, I think, in the early 60s A.D. And Paul says, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Well, what day is he talking about? The Lord's coming. And I always emphasize that, especially lately in our local classes here in Oklahoma, you want to remember that the whole concept up until just before Paul is martyred is that the Lord would be coming in short order. They had no idea that it would be 2,000 years. Never entered their mind. They were expecting the Lord to come almost any moment, even in Paul's lifetime. And so here's another indication of that. Don't forsake yourselves meeting together, Paul says, especially as we draw near to the Lord's return. Well, if it was apropos in 61 or 62 AD, how much more today? You know, I've always gone back to the cartoon of the old caveman who had written across his cave, the end is near. But the second picture, he had added what? ER. See, today the end is nearer than it was yesterday. Today, this verse is more appropriate. It's 2,000 years closer than when Paul wrote it. And so as we see the day approaching, encourage one another that the Lord is coming. Don't be caught asleep. Don't be caught unprepared. In fact, the verse just comes to mind. 1 John, I think it is. See, now all these things I don't prepare the night before. I wish I could, but I just can't. 1 John, that's back a little further, isn't it? Back. We'll be getting into these little epistles when we finish Hebrews, hopefully. But 1 John, I think it's chapter, chapter 3. Yeah, 1 John chapter 3, starting at verse 1. And see, John's concept of the Lord's coming is the same as Paul. It could happen any time. Back there in the early 1st century, in the 60s. All right, chapter 3 of 1 John, starting at verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we as believers should be called the sons of God or the children of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Now, that's plain enough, isn't it? My goodness, after three years, amongst his own people. What was the statement of the majority? Crucify him. Kill him. They didn't know him. Well, that's the world's attitude toward us, whether you know it or not, see? All right, and so it knows us not because it knew him not. Now here it comes, verse 2. Beloved, now we are the sons or the born ones of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know beyond a shadow of a doubt, we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And now verse 3, and every man, that's a generic term, meaning women, boys, and girls who are believers. So every believer that has this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he, the Lord, is pure. What does that tell us? I'll bet you one thing for sure. If you knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that by 12 o'clock tomorrow the Lord would have come and we're out of here, you'd act a lot different for the next 36 hours. <laughs> Wouldn't we? Every one of us. We would make sure that we hadn't had any evil thoughts cobwebbing our mind. We would make sure that we are spiritually as well as physically and materially ready for that trumpet call that's going to come sometime between now and noon tomorrow. 
I know we would. There isn't a person in this room that wouldn't take special note to be ready when that moment comes. Well, we should be just as ready all the time, see? But we're human. We get lax. And the first thing you know, a week's gone by, and we haven't really thought about the Lord's coming. But hey, it's got to be on our mind constantly, especially as we see, as Paul says in Hebrews, the day appearing. All right, now then, the other one that just thought of while I was reading this one, of course, was Philippians. Now I'll go back to Philippians, because all I want you to see is how the word fits. Everything ties together. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, chapter 3, starting at verse 20 and 21. <coughs> Philippians 3, 20 and 21. Got it? For our conversation, or if you have a margin, it's citizenship. Our citizenship is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile, or this corrupt body, that it, this body, may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, the resurrected body, according to the working whereby he is able, even to subdue all things unto himself. In other words, what are we be constantly aware of? That maybe in the next hour, we're out of this old body of flesh, and we're in the new, and we're in glory. That's our blessed hope. And uh, I can't stress it enough that all through the early days of Christendom, it was that imminent return of Christ that they were looking for. And like I've said over and over, Paul wrote of it as though he was coming in his lifetime until just before he was martyred, he finally speaks of the fact that he's going to go through physical death. But I don't think Paul ever expected to. He thought the Lord was going to return before he would die a physical death. All right, back to chapter 10 then again. And so we're to encourage one another. We're to fellowship with one another more and more as we see the time of his coming approaching. All right, now in the next few moments, I guess we got time. Verse 26, and there again is a verse that arouses so many questions. And uh, really, it's quite simple. All I have to tell you, well, remember what I taught in chapter 6, wasn't it? 5 or 6? Yeah, chapter 6, same thing. Same thing. All right, let's look at it first. Verse 20, if we sin willfully, after we have received a knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. All right, now, in order to understand this, you've got to get the big picture. Who are the Hebrews? Jews. What is their belief system? Judaism. And what was Judaism based on? The temple worship and the sacrifices and the feast days. And all the various demands for a particular sin, you would bring this particular sacrifice. Now, this whole book of Hebrews, as I've been stressing now for I don't know how many months, was written first and foremost to those Hebrew believers. And they were having such a hard time breaking from their old religious system of Judaism with temple worship and the sacrifices and then the whole nine yards. And as I explained in one of my classes just this last week, you take people who have come out of a cult, and cults are satanically capable of brainwashing people to such an extent it's almost impossible to bring them out of it except for the power of God. And I've had some. And the first thing they tell me, but Les, it's so hard to break with what we have been taught for a whole lifetime. I know that. It is hard. But if you're going to be a believer in the Word of God, that's what you have to do. Well, these people are the same way. They had been steeped in Judaism. Ever since 1500 B.C., Israel was under the law. And they were steeped in temple worship with all of its attendant sacrifices. Now then, the key to whole of this whole verse is the last part of the verse. 
that if you're going to willfully turn away from Paul's revelations of the grace of God and go back into Judaism, what would they be practicing? Sacrifices. They'd be going back to their animal sacrifices. But would it do them any good? No. And that's what this verse is screaming at them. If you're going to turn around and walk away from this, what has been revealed to you by the grace of God, and you're going to go back into Judaism with all of its temple worship and sacrifices, hey, you're out of it. God no longer dealing with people on the basis of the animal sacrifices because he was the complete, perfect sacrifice. And when people turned around and said, well, I'm going back to my temple worship, I'm going back to the animal sacrifices, they were, as it says in chapter 6, crucifying the Lord afresh. How? By telling him that his sacrifice counted for nothing. That animal's blood was better than his. You see the picture? All right, now I said, uh, I'll take you back to chapter 6, but read verse 27 as well that after they've received the knowledge of the truth and there remains no more sacrifice, animal sacrifices won't help you, but instead, if you're going to go back into Judaism, there is a certain fearful looking for of what? Judgment. Judgment, because they have spurned God's grace. And so there's a judgment and a fiery indignation which shall future devour the adversaries. Well, what's it speaking of? The great white throne judgment. When lost Jews are going to be condemned to the lake of fire, just as well as lost humanity in general. And if they're going to turn away from God's offer of grace and salvation by faith in that grace alone, and they're going to go back to animal sacrifices, and they've got nothing facing them but the fiery indignation of eternal doom. All right, now let's go back to chapter 6. I said it's the same thing. So if somebody asks you, well, what about Hebrews 10, 26? You tell them it's the same thing as Hebrews chapter 6, and then you're out of it. But Hebrews chapter 6, we'll review it. Verse 4. <coughs> Hebrews 6, verse 4. For it is what? Impossible. And that means what it says. It's impossible. For those who were once enlightened and they had tasted. Now, I've had quite a few people respond already. So some of the stations show this on Sundays. And so this has already been out on the air and we've already had some comment that they never realized before that you do not sustain any amount of energy by simply tasting something. You can taste from now till doomsday and you'll starve to death because you don't really latch on to something. You're, all you're doing is tasting it. And see, that's what these people did. They looked at Paul's program. They looked at this offer of salvation through faith alone. The Holy Spirit enlightened them enough for them to consider it. They could have stepped in. They could have stepped over the threshold. They could have had it. But did they? No. Now read on. They were even made partakers of the Holy Spirit. And again, the word is, they've tasted the good word of God, the powers of the world to come. In other words, the view of the coming kingdom. Now, if they shall fall away. Now, I remember when I taught this several months ago, that I explained that this word in the Greek is not the same that's translated a falling away in Thessalonians. This is a Greek word that is never used any other place in Scripture. And I don't even know if I can remember what it was, but uh, parapipto, was that it, Jerry? I think so. It was parapipto, which meant a scornful. And the only way the translators could really come to that conclusion is that some great linguist in the past had found one Hebrew word that sort of came close. And I think the Hebrew word was mulhal, M U. H-A-L, something like that. But the Greek word is parapipto. Now, the word for falling away in Thessalonians is apostasia. Two totally different words. All right. So this parapipto meant to scornfully, as a woman who was turning her back on her husband and going into an adulterous situation. Now, that's what the word implies. Not just someone who hadn't quite understood it, 
Not someone who was caught in a moment of weakness, but someone who had fully comprehended all this. Someone whom the Lord has opened up their thinking, but in a scornful rejection, they just said, I'll have nothing to do with this. I'm going back to my religion. Now you got the picture? And when I talk about cult people, that's exactly where most of them are. Even when they see the truth, they get all the pressure from their fellow cult people, and back they go, and they scorn what they have been enlightened to see. All right, so now then, if you want the answer to Hebrews 10, verse 26, you just tell folks, read Hebrews 6. It means the same thing. When these people have willfully, scornfully said, we'll not have anything to do with this Jesus of Nazareth. All right? Verse 27, just read it in order to get into verse 28. But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation. In other words, the lake of fire that is facing the lost, which shall devour the adversaries. Now verse 28. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Now, you know, you've heard me say it over and over, especially those of you who are in my classes every week. The law was what? Huh? Huh? Say it. I said beggarly. Yeah, yeah, it was beggarly, but what else? It was cruel. The law had no mercy. The law was strict. And consequently, when someone knowing that it said, Thou shalt not commit adultery, and they went ahead and did it anyway, what did the law demand? Death. Not with a spear, not with a sword, but how? By stoning, which was a slow, tortuous death. That's what the law demanded. Severe. That's the word I was looking for. The law was severe. It was merciless. And so this is what Paul is stressing. Now remember, the law of Moses was severe. And yet it had none of the opportunities that this gospel of grace gives us. So if God permitted the law to severely punish those who broke that, then how much more capable is he of consigning lost people to the lake of fire? Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felder.